We were launching our silk pillowcases and on the morning of the launch, we were launched at a price point that was more at a luxury price point with some of our top competitors at the highest end. Well, we're coming in new. So when we launched it, I immediately was like, oh, well, this is a flop. This isn't working. We need to pivot and we need to pivot immediately. everyone, welcome back to the Screw It, Let's Do This podcast, where we interview entrepreneurs about their story. I'm your host, Shelby. And I'm your other host, Therese. And today we have Chloe. Woo! Woo! <laughs> um, you guys, Chloe has a couple businesses. So Multiple. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to pass it over to Chloe to give you guys some background about who she is and the businesses that she's started. Well, hello. Yes, I am Chloe Homan. I am the founder, CEO, content creator, whatever you want to call me of two businesses, Frizz and Frills and Curlfriend Collective. So I can tell you a little bit about well, Frizz and Frills. Start with the first yeah, one. We yeah, we have to know Let's start with the, first the OG, the Frizz and Frills that started in you know, 2018. 2018. Yes. Okay. So okay. we recently just had our five-year anniversary. Oh my gosh. And it's wild to think that it's been five years that I've been doing content creation and a little over four years I've been doing it full time. Wow. Wait, yeah. you said four years. Four years full time, wow. five years total. You did that fast. I yeah, did. That was quick. Yeah. I'm really not good at doing things slowly. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, you're You're like foot on the gas. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Which I feel like you two are as well. It depends. It depends on the day. I, yeah, I, I feel, feel like though when I look at you, I'm like, oh. Like you're <laughs> sprinting. And I, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's phenomenal though. Like the things that I feel like you've done so quickly. And when you say you started Frizz and Frills five years ago, was that the day you made the account or the day you're like, I'm going to make a business with this? Not when I made a, when I decided I would make a business. Let, let me back up for you. So when I started Frizz and Frills, I was doing uh, business to business sales. I was in the corporate ladder. I was not doing anything really creatively. I studied graphic design and advertising in at college. Whitewater? At hey, Whitewater. my girl. Bleed purple, <laughs> bleed purple. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> totally. 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 Totes. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what did you do at White? What was your degree? Is it marketing? Sales? Uh, graphic design and oh, advertising. Graphic design and marketing. Yeah. Yeah. So I studied mainly graphic design. I did some, um, you know, actual like drawing, painting, you know, all of that ceramics um, where it was fine arts, but which I love and I still love ceramics. I still do that. But I went to school for that and then immediately kind of transitioned more into this sales role, which was great from a personable aspect. Like I love working with people, but it had no creativity whatsoever. And so when I was 27, I was really feeling like that lost part of me, just this kind of little hole wasn't being filled in my life. And so I had seen blogging at that time. Blogging was really big. And I was like, well, maybe I should try blogging. That might be kind of fun doing like content creation, seeing what that would do just to fill that void in my life, not even thinking career wise, but thinking just, okay, well, this could be a fun passion project. And within about three to six months, I was like, I can do this as a business. Really? Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. I feel I, like you were born for that though. Yeah, literally. Because if I was blogging, I'd be like, look at my mascara that I've had <laughs> for two years. I tried vlogging. <laughs> and it's crunchy. I tried vlogging <laughs> for crunchy. so long. Like vlogging on YouTube. My family loved it. And that was it. Like 300 views. I'd be like, yeah. Uh, blogging or vlogging? Vlogging. Vlogging. Yes. So I didn't vlog. Okay. Blo I was blogging. So I was mm. writing. Oh my. Yeah. God. You weren't even on Instagram yet? You were just doing a well, blog. So I had Instagram and I had my own website where I was writing on the blog and doing newsletters and things like that. About curly hair. Makeup, about, curly some about hair. curly hair, some about fashion. Um, wow. I've always dabbled a little bit in petite fashion because I yeah. am 4'11". Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Teresa. Yeah, and I, I know. Use. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was dabbling a lot at that in that first few months of not really knowing what direction I really wanted to go in. And it became very apparent and should have been way more apparent to me that curly hair was my niche, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what everybody wanted to know. They're like, but 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 enough about that. But tell me about what you do for your hair. What do you do for your curls? 
how do you style them? What products do you use? You know, how, what's your drying process? Literally wanting to know each and every piece. What do you, what products do you recommend for me? This is about my hair. The amount of unsolicited hair picks I have received <laughs> is ridiculous. <laughs> oh my God. That's gosh. crazy. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of wild. Yeah, it happens all the time where people just send me a novel about their hair and then want me to diagnose it. Wow. Which we cannot do. We do not have time. Yeah, <laughs> no. So, um, yeah, within three to six months, I realized that's what I needed to focus on more than anything. And I just pedaled to the metal. I was working 80, 90 hour weeks. Oh. Yeah. Well, you, wait, you were still at your other I job. I was still though. at my other job. Okay. Yeah. So, like, you were basically working all day for that Two job? Two full time jobs. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I was working like 50, 60 hours a week and like another like 30, 40. Oh my gosh. Yeah. With that. So, I was just working day and night all weekend, just trying to figure it out. And so, in fall of 2019, is when I finally made the move to quit my job and go full-time. And I'm so, so incredibly glad I decided to do that. Hindsight, I'm glad I didn't know pandemic was coming <laughs> <laughs> because that would have absolutely scared the absolute crap out of me. And I don't know if I would have even made the move if that had happened. Say I had waited six months, I probably would have stayed a lot longer. So I'm glad it happened the way it did because it actually propelled me forward because people were online more than they ever had. They had more time to be online. So I was able to just work in my own, you know, world and just keep on growing and keep on serving my community. Mm -hmm. well, how long were you doing the full-time job and the blogging? About a year. Wow. So you were like grinding for an entire year. The first three to six months was probably like partially grinding. And then the last six months was genuinely just grinding to no level, like no end. So one of the questions that I, I always wonder with entrepreneurs that have like, you know, full-time jobs, and then before they take that jump into their actual business, what was like the, the point where you're like, I'm going to make the leap? Because I was crying every day at work. <laughs> That's so relatable. Oh my gosh. Literally. I hated my job so much. The job that I had taken on that past like six months was falsely sold to me. So basically I was painted a really pretty picture of what this position looked like. And then once I got into the position, it was completely different than what I had been promised. And I was traveling all the time on one to two day trips around the U.S., I hated it because I didn't feel, also, it wasn't feeding my passion of being creative, of, you know, there was just nothing really holding me there. And this company was just, it was just overall not, not a good fit. So, um, crying every day at work. Yeah, I was, was crying every, I was pretty much crying every day uh, from work. I was telling Ryan, my husband, who works businesses with me, and he, he's like, okay, we cannot continue this. I'm like, I know we can't continue this. And it was trying to figure out, well, at what point can we afford to make that jump, right? So I had, on a consistent basis at that point, I was able to replace about half my salary based on some longer-term contracts. And I was like, okay, I think this is the time to just make, make it happen. I actually gave them a month's notice to let them try to fill my position. And I even helped like do a day or two of training on that person. And I was like, I didn't want to leave them in a lurch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very sweet. Yeah, yeah. that's really nice too. <laughs> but um, realizing how bad my mental health was at that point was really what made it. And then by having that extra time that I wasn't spending on that corporate job, I was able to just really put the pedal to the metal on Frizz and Frills and work it full time and grow it. And here it is. Yeah. yeah. Did you always have like an entrepreneurship mindset? Did you think when you were growing up, like, oh, someday I'll own a business. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted to be my own, be my own boss. I've always wanted to do something different, create. I've always known that was in my blood, in my just, I feel like, genetic makeup. Wow. Yeah. So um, I'll tell you a story. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you a story. Thanks. <laughs> Six-year-old Chloe. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. okay. <laughs> Six-year-old six Chloe over here wanting what, at that time, this was in the 90s, My Size Barbie. Do you remember My Size Barbie by chance? Were they, like, actually, like, larger? Like, larger. Yeah. Like, like, literally, six-year-old Chloe would be the same size. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
And so this was like the hot new toy, but they were really expensive, right? They were big. They were yeah. probably like a couple hundred bucks, which at that point, like my parents were not in a place they could afford that. And so they were like, you're going to have to, you know, figure it out if that's what you want. So I, for all summer, went down to the driveway. I made lemonade. I sold, <laughs> I sold you know, chips and drinks and all the things at garage sales and all the things until I saved up enough monies. I think I saved up a hundred dollars, and I still got, and I got it secondhand because I love a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I will always have a deal. It secondhand, yeah, <laughs> secondhand. And I loved the absolute crap out of that. But that was my first kind of like little entrepreneurial, I feel like moment mm-hmm. at six years old. So you were hooked. I was hooked. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've always loved it. Dang, I'm I now. I'm wondering. Got it secondhand. Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> at six, that's so cute. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, when you went to college, what made you not go into like entrepreneurship as your major? Did you like? Yeah, what was your thought? You know, it's funny because my dad told me I should. Oh, really? Yeah, he told me I should study business and do like marketing or advertising as my like secondary, right? Or what do you call it? Your emphasis or whatever. Minor. Minor. You can, emphasis yeah. minor, etc. Yeah. And of course I was like, I was 18 years old. I was like, I don't want to do, I want to do art. (laughs) I -hmm. don't want to do that. And hindsight, I kind of wish I had listened to him. (laughs) Really? Yeah, I do. I do kind of wish I had listened to him from from that because I think it would have set me up a little bit more on the business understanding Mm -hmm. going into what I do now. However, I also am glad I still studied art and graphic design because a lot of those pieces that I learned from just a very base level have also helped me create really great content Yeah, as well. So understanding some of those basic principles of design, I do think those carried over. Does Ryan kind of fill that spot? So you work with your husband. Mm-hmm. What does the differences look like? Like what do you do versus what does he does in a, do in a day kind of? Mm. Let's see here. So he well, wait, I asked you this question before and you had a funny answer. So I'm going to see if it's the same oh. one. I asked you like two years ago. Oh, but that well, was I wonder what I said. That was before you had Girlfriend Collective mm, though. Yeah. So I'll tell you what you said if you tell me what he okay, does now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so now with Frizz and Frills and Girlfriend Collective, he is way more involved in Girlfriend Collective, which by the way, Girlfriend Collective is the scrunchies. Yeah, we yes. didn't even get there. I know we didn't. For those who are not watching the video, you should stop and turn on the video and see these amazing scrunchies. Do you want to talk about them for just a second? Sure. And then we can go back to Ryan. Yeah. Um. So, yes. So, our silk hair accessory brand is Curlfriend Collective. We make specific silk accessories for curls, coils, and waves because that area of the market is just really undersold too. Like we do not have accessories for our hair that are really made specifically for us. And most of the time, accessory brands are for everybody. And then we end up breaking the scrunchie. We end up overstretching the scrunchie. It ends up just not fitting our hair. You know, any of the above adds breakage, damage, just nothing great really for those of us, especially with really thick curly hair. And so launched that in November of 2021. We're almost coming up on two years, which is very exciting. And so we have, gosh, I don't know. I think we've sold 15,000 scrunchies Holy or something like wow. that. Yeesh. In the past two years, something like that around the world. That's yeah. wild. Well, I, you like, I love when I see the videos of you and Ryan like packing stuff. Like you yeah. stored that all yeah. in your Fun. garage or your farm area. Mm-hmm. You guys your have whole farm thing. area. Well, like, we have, do have a hobby farm. We do yeah. have a hobby farm. So we'll back it up again. We do have a hobby farm. And so we have an extra building that we didn't know when we moved into this place. We moved in three years ago and Carlton Collective wasn't even an idea at that time that we had this whole huge extra building that was originally supposed to be Ryan's man cave area. Oh, with the golf simulator? Well, the golf simulator is on one side and then the other side is supposed to be a workshop, which is now slowly turned into the Girlfriend Collective Warehouse more and more and more. I feel like we need to do a tour. I think we need to do a tour. I agree. And with the chicken. Oh my gosh. We should have to get an egg out of the chicken coop. Wait, you still still have chickens, right? We have one chicken. Okay, I was going to say, that was the source. Hennifer. Hennifer Aniston. (laughs) <laughs> oh, actually? Yeah. Wait, that's yeah. hilarious. I had my community name them. And oh then my God. We only have one left, though. Oh, Mark. yeah. I remember Hennifer seeing the video a when that other. Menace. Yeah. Hennifer's a menace. She is. Yeesh. She took the rest out. What mm. do you mean? 
Oh, she pecked the rest. <gasps> oh my gosh. Okay, well, we're getting really deep into the farm. Farm tour to come. Yeah, for farm tour to come. But anyways, yes, we have the warehouse on our property, which is really amazing. So we don't actually have to go somewhere to fulfill. We can do that literally in our backyard, which is pretty sick. Ryan, he handles all the fulfillment. So where we have our warehouse facility is where he pretty much lives half of his day, majority of the time. Sometimes multiple full days, depending on what's going on that week. If we have a launch, if we have a sale, if we have anything really exciting going on, then he's spending a lot of time out there fulfilling the orders, packing them, getting them sent out to USPS, UPS, et cetera, to get them out to our community. Wow. Yeah. And then he also makes sure that I get fed. <laughs> Same with Vicky. Wait, that's literally exactly what you told me the last time I yeah. talked to you. You mm-hmm. had told me that Ryan had, I believe, just left his job. Like you, I, I forget if you said retired him, but in a sense, you said yeah. you had retired him from his corporate job. And I'm like, so what does he do? And she, you're like, he makes sure, makes sure that I'm fed and happy and that house is clean or something like Honestly, that. Honestly, also accurate. He makes sure that I'm not hangry. Mm-hmm. He literally sent me out the door today with a baggie of food, like a little lunchbox. Oh my food. gosh. I love oh my that. Gosh. Yeah, because I, I love that. didn't schedule an eating today. Wow. <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. That's what I want. Yeah. So he's always like, please eat. You're, you're better to do, no no. Let's be honest. It's also it's also selfish for him because otherwise I am a piece of work. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> he's he's like please. We need to keep you fed. Please so that help. You're nice. <laughs> help yourself. Right. Oh my help gosh. me help you. Yeah yeah. <laughs> that's that's great. So you work with a ton of really huge brands. Like I've seen you work with Target, Revlon, L'Oreal. Am I right there? I've worked with L'Oreal. I haven't worked with Revlon. Revlon sponsored me though. <laughs> who's the, who's the biggest one you want to work with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and which one? Who's the biggest one you want to work with? Like your dream. The biggest one I would love to work with. Like I'd love to work with Sephora. I'd love to work with Nordstrom. I'd love to work with some of these bigger retailers. Also because I think that we would align so much with Curl Fern Collective as a whole. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love to work with some of those. But yeah, I've worked with Ulta. Ooh. I've, you know, oh gosh, a lot of, a lot of curl brands, a lot of curly hair product brands. Yeah, you like, You've worked with the most amazing people, and like you have this amazing in your studio at home. Like your, well, do you call it a studio? Studio, I call it a studio or office space? Yeah. You have a whole wall of just like products from all these brands you yes. work with. It is so fun. Again, we need to do a house tour. I know. I for real. think we do. I actually think we do, and we'll set that up. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's um, do it. That the, seriously, though, that'd be great. Ending it with a bonfire and grill out. And <laughs> Love stuff done. Um, but anyway, so but of course you didn't like start out working with those types of brands. So I want to talk about like. I want you to talk about how you kind of like gain that following and where did you start and yeah, that whole journey with sponsorships and brand deals. So I got to think way back to probably more so 2019 is when I started taking on some partnerships or sponsorships. And I realized that those were, could actually be quite lucrative. At that time, those were probably a hundred to $500 I was getting per sponsorship And then over time, over a three to four year span, that raised into like some sponsorships being in the five figure realm. (laughs) (laughs) So it it, now everyone is not like that. Some of them are somewhere in between, but normally they range anywhere from a couple thousand dollars to like seven, eight thousand dollars, depending on what the deliverables are, depending on what the usage rights are. Um, you know, the usage rights are a really big piece to it, depending on what um, they're looking to use it for. So are they looking to use it for ads? Are they looking to use it for their website? Are they wanting to? This is giving me like PTSD from that one brand deal that you tried, you helped me with. Oh, yes. That's not, we won't yeah. go into that. Mm-hmm. We won't go, we won't go that into That was it. intense. I didn't know anything, but I did. It's, there's a lot of nuances to it. <sighs> there are yeah. so, weren't you planning, like, weren't you thinking at one point to make a course on how to do that stuff? Yes. And it's still something that's in the back of my mind. I still want to do a course on on that or a course on even just helping small businesses learn social media too. That's something I've also thought about because I think a lot of small businesses just don't know where to start when it comes to social media and how to make their time count the most. But right now we're focusing a lot more on Curl Friend Collective and just getting that grown. And I also working on getting our team where they're really, they can basically self-manage. And then where Ryan and I will have the ability to snowbird for like January, February is goals, goals. Like that's what we're Mm -hmm. working towards. That's what I'm also working towards. Time freedom. Time freedom is everything. Genuinely. Where where do you want to snowbird? 
Belize. Belize. <laughs> <laughs> so you travel so much. We do travel a lot. I yeah. love it. It's so fun to watch. Again, home tour, you buy something fun from every place you go. Yes, yes. It's so we always bring back a piece of art anytime we leave oh the gosh. country, especially. Oh, this is I'm yeah, you're my goal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, I love you. The, the, the travel, yeah, the snowboarding thing. I feel like that's what we all want to do. Like Shelby and yeah. I both talked about wanting to like I want to be in Florida, but mm-hmm. be able to go other places too. But Florida is just oof. I'm trying to surround myself with more people who are already doing that so I can learn from them. You got to go to a country club then. Right. Or, I mean, (laughs) seriously, just being aligned with more entrepreneurs who are going towards the same goals and we're all at different steps in that journey, I think is so crucial so that we can learn from each other. We can share ideas, things that worked for us, things that didn't work. I love that. Yeah. I feel that so Mm -hmm. much. And in different age demographics too. Like, it's, it's so funny. I've always been very drawn to friendships who people are, who are older than me. Oh, really? Yeah. A lot of my friends are in 30s, 40s, and 50s. Shoot. I need to get yeah. some older friends. I really am older drawn to people. Older friends are great. <laughs> older friends are great. Man, we'll have to talk about where you find them all because yeah. they're not hanging oh, out. my next bonfire. They'll yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> for real, for real. Okay. The, can we jump back to a question that I still want to dig deeper on? Like, how did you grow your following? It's a slow grow. It's a slow grow without a doubt. When you're growing your social media, I feel like nowadays you see a lot of TikTok where they're all of a sudden they have a viral video and then it's like these people are famous overnight. That is not the norm. That is not, that has by far not been the norm for the past like five, 10 years in socials. It's a slow grow and just really leaning into what your community wants consistently asking them, what are you looking for right now? What do you like most? What are you not liking most? And then let it, helping that lead you as long as it feels aligned for you as well. Because there are some things that people will throw out and be like, well, that's not aligned at all. Just because you said it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. But if they're saying something that's a pretty strong consensus, then that means I probably need to go more that direction if it feels aligned. So really leaning back into the community, which we also do with Curlfriend Collective a lot, I think that's one of the biggest things you can do as an entrepreneur is leaning into your community if you already have it. Even if that community is only like 100, 200 people. Mm -hmm. Like the online community you're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like when I started Frizz and Frills, I I changed over my personal account. I had 100, 150 followers or something like that in 2018. So it was a slow growth. The first year I think was... I don't even remember what we, we get. What I gained, like maybe ten thousand or something like that. Well, yeah, I'm trying to hit that. <laughs> no, and 10, you're gonna hit that. in a year. <laughs> but remember, you say slow grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that was that's a fast grow though. Like, what do you attribute that to? Your consistency, constant posting, really quality stuff. Like consistency and zoning and zoning in on what works. Zoning in on what is getting the most engagement. What are people asking the most about, creating content around that. I am big on educating as well. I love to educate. So a lot of my content you'll find are tips or tutorials, things like that, because I find it's extremely valuable for a community. And you'll find, and you might you might find this too with people that you see online. Do you tend to follow somebody quicker if they're teaching you something that you want to know about? Or do you tend to follow somebody quicker because they're just like, maybe entertaining. Mm. I just love to follow people that show me their morning routines. I love Well, lovely, those. lovely. So they're teaching you your their morning routines. That's yeah, a little bit of entertainment and a little bit of education. Yes. It's like a little bit of Yes, both. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I feel like just leaning more into that and consistency. consistency. Consistency is very important, not only for your community, but also for the algorithms. You're also big on TikTok. I am, yeah. So... What's the biggest differences you think between the two? Like what Mm. key things do you need to know for both? Because I am, Mm. TikTok's a tough. Yeah, like it's not tough. Oh, tough. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it tough, right? Because we can, it's reframing our mind, right? Reframing Uh, our mind. There's no even mind to reframe. I just don't even go there with TikTok. Mm -hmm. Like I need need a TikTok strategy because like a lot of my clientele is on TikTok. Baby, bridal, like that age group. Absolutely. They're getting, you know, that's there. So tell us about that. So tell me. Let me tell you. Okay. So <laughs> Get out my as far as TikTok goes, TikTok does really well when it's very authentic. It's community-based. It, it almost is like the stuff that you're 
posting, not always, but a lot of the stuff is almost like what you're posting on Instagram stories. It's more talking to the camera. It's more relatable. It's more them getting to know you as a person. Um, You can educate, you can inspire, you can do all those other things as well. But opening up, I have found, has been really key on TikTok so that people know you as a whole person. Versus on Instagram, it's kind of, a, it's it's less than it used to be with like the perfect grid and everything, but it's still more stylized. It's still a little bit more perfect. I tend to cross post a lot of stuff on both. I personally, one of my favorite strategies is posting most everything first on TikTok, seeing what resonates best, and then I'll post it to Instagram wow. video content wise. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Because it normally does not resonate the other way. Instagram, if you're creating for Instagram specifically, because it's more about the pretty, the stuff that goes, if you try reposting that onto TikTok, you used to be able to do that a little bit more last year, but now not so much. Interesting. Yeah. What do you think does better on Instagram, photos or video? I think it depends on who you are, honestly. Uh, If you had to ask me that a year ago, I would, even six months ago, I was at video, hands down. But they're really starting to reprioritize photo. So I'm starting to bring photo back into my feed a little bit more. How do you know these rules? Like, how does someone like me and Therese— Who are you friends with that you know? I'm not. I'm not. (laughs) You just look at the data, kind of? some of the—yeah, some of the data that I'm seeing from my own analytics, as well as what I'm starting to see pop up in my feed more. So if you just pay attention to what your feed is showing you, it'll teach you— a lot. If you look, if they're all of a sudden you're seeing a lot of shopping posts, there's a reason for that. TikTok shop right now. They are prioritizing shopping posts. So if you have something to sell or something to link within TikTok shop, they're more than likely going to prioritize that content over something else because they are trying to get that to pop off right now for them. They're trying to become another Amazon. What the? Mm -hmm. Yeah. TikTok man. TikTok man. (laughs) Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Do you sell a lot on TikTok? Do what? Girlfriend, do you sell a lot on? We TikTok? have not capitalized on that market right now. No, we just got started on Amazon though. Really? Yeah. I was gonna say it's not like you're doing too much, no. right? We're never <laughs> doing too much. <laughs> yeah, tell Ryan that he'd be like, <laughs> "Come okay. on, Ryan." <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, Amazon. So like, yes. Are so you shipping we're direct? Amazon. Uh, we're, we're doing Amazon FBA. So we it's fulfilled by Amazon. Oh, sick. Yeah. So we send it send it in. They have it at their warehouses. Two-day free shipping. Whole thing. Wow. And that's with, for our best sellers. So these Onyx Black Scrunchies, those are in there. This one is in it. Um, some new launches eventually will be in it. Oh. oh yeah. Interesting. Are we, are we just <laughs> teasing these new launches now? When are we going to talk about them? You want to talk about it? Kind of. Talk okay. about it. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about it. So, well, here, let me tell you the story. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I'll tell you the story of how I conceptualize this and then I'll reveal. So I realized that with our scrunchies, these huge scrunchies, these are great, but they are also meant to show in the hair. That's the the reason I designed them that way, because most scrunchies don't show in our hair as curlies because our curls tend to take them over. So I wanted something that would show, be styled, you know, and be a part of your outfit. It's an accessory. But what we didn't have was something that was quiet, right? Something that would go with any outfit, something that would just automatically be great for your curls, no matter what the situation was. And so I had an idea pop up in my head one night where I was like, you know what? What would happen if it just basically became invisible in your curls? What would what would that look like? And I was like, what if it was literally designed almost like camouflage, where it, does, it just fits into your curls with that same pattern. Okay, so I took a picture, mm-hmm. literally went into the bathroom. I'm like, okay, let's take a close-up picture of my curls, put this in Canva. Let's go ahead and like, we'll blur it out a little bit and see what that looks like. Printed it out on my at-home printer, you know, cheapo printer. Mm-hmm. Literally cut it out, just scrunched it like a scrunchie would be. And I was like, would this work? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I think this is actually something. I think this would work. I think people would be intrigued by this. So I went to my Frizz and Frills audience and I did a poll in stories. I'm like, would you want something that matches your hair? Would you would you wear that? How much would you buy? What would like I asked them a bunch of different questions and it was a resounding, oh my gosh, yes, we need this. So I immediately hired a lawyer oh to pat to help me see if this was patentable. 
because I had never seen this out. Wait, where do you even find a lawyer that does that stuff? I went through UpCounsel. So UpCounsel, so it's like Fiverr. Have you heard of Fiverr? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. UpCounsel is for lawyers. Fiverr for lawyers. Wow, yeah. to tell Cole to get on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What the heck? So it actually worked out really nicely. Wow. Yeah. So that's a— Nice. Side note, yeah. yeah. Side note, like that's a, that's a really great resource. I love UpCounsel, especially for small businesses where it's like I cannot easily access a, you know, a lawyer on retainer. I can't easily access, you know, some of these people that you only need for one little project. Fiverr is phenomenal and UpCounsel has been phenomenal. There's another one. Upwork. Upwork is another one. So I went to hire the lawyer and I, I found her. We talked. We chatted. Okay, this is this is a patentable idea. We, within, I think, a month had submitted the patents for the design as well as the utility. And uh, it's been over a year-long process for these to come to fruition. And they launch on October 27th, Dang. officially. We just had our photo shoot with 10 models last week. That's what you've been teasing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've been watching your stories, and I'm like, what is coming? Who like, are the models from? Like, just in— They're from our community. Like, Madison or, like— a lot of them are from Madison or Wisconsin right. in general, but they're right. from our Curly community. Wow. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So this is our third, second or third time hiring just truly from our community for our models, not professional models. Because I, my hope is I always want somebody to go to our site and be like, oh, I see me. Because that's something that for me, I didn't see ever when I was little. You didn't see curly hair hardly ever ever, especially in the 90s, early 2000s. And so I always want people to be like, oh, I'm represented on our website. And so I think we do that through hiring through our customer base. Mm -hmm. I would get a perm if you ever were like short. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you I ever had a perm, short, I had a perm at one time. <laughs> Why? There was like Why a— Why did you get a perm? Because you did. It was a thing in high school. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. I can it speak. wasn't perms like that. It was like looser perms. So like I had a friend in high school who got a perm all the time, and it w- made it wavy. Mm, so it just had texture. Is she 70? No, no. We literally did this. I the, the So only many time, people tell me all the time that they get perms. It smelled so bad. Oh, yeah. I, did I, you I mean, do it's it terrible for your hair. No, I got it done. I think I'm like looking back. Basically, it made my hair so dead. I ended up cutting. Yeah, exactly. It literally kills your hair. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty yeah. happy. But yeah, was I would do it, it to be the the face that, of girlfriend the day collective. I, the day I see with the perm. <laughs> oh my gosh, I that would be. I would love that day. I would love that day. <laughs> but anyways, maybe one day. One day. <laughs> so we launched the hair match collection on October 27th. So by the time this airs, I think. It's going to be launching. It, yeah. It might already be launched. It might not be, depending on when you're watching this. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's I think launching the 25th. Oh, Yeah, really? I think the 25th. So okay. if you're watching the 25th on this, the day this launches, it will not be ready yet until Friday. But then on Friday, it's get, get, get it. it before it sells <laughs> yes. out. So I'll show you. I have, them, I have them sneakily hidden. hidden over here with all my scrunchies. <laughs> so we have anything to match majority of hair colors. The design, it, which is part of the patent, is that it literally is made to look like a curl pattern of highs and lows of your hair texture because our hair is not one dimensional, right? Mm. So this, we can put it up even next to it. Yeah, that's so wild. Yeah, it's like, crazy. It doesn't look it like really... it matches like on your arm as well as it does when it's in your and hair, right? Yeah. 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 Is... You want me to put it on? Yeah. yeah oh my gosh. Of. Would you be willing? <laughs> Yes, I would be. I'll be the model. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is crazy to People see. People have to watch yeah. this one. <laughs> so when we put this up in the hair. Oh my gosh. You can't, yeah. It just looks like it's. I feel like we're on it. Um, HSN. Yeah, no, I literally <laughs> feel like we're on like, yeah. So today you can buy it for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Call now. <laughs> Call now. We're down to 10 in stock. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's like is- crazy how well it really like. Matches? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I, right now I'm looking for it so I can see it because I'm looking. But if I didn't know, like I wasn't sure, I'd be like, how's her hair like that? Is that hairspray? (laughs) Right. You know, like I wouldn't be able to tell. You can't see it. So it's made with our same elastic that our community loves, which is super, super stretchy, super large. But it also is the perfect size so that you can also easily just put it on your wrist and it's going to be really comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not be like strangling your wrist, which those kind of scrunchies are also terrible. So it took me almost a year 
to test these on all these different hair colors and types to see what colors we actually wanted to launch with. I've probably trialed at least 30 or 40 of these different colors over the last year. Wow. You can tell. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty incredible. So now you have this, like you have your classic, big, scrunchy. You have like a bunch of design patterns. We do. And materials, right? Like, don't you have velvet? All silk. All silk. All silk. All silk. Only silk. Um, But we have silk scrunchies. We have silk pillowcases. We also have silk scarves. Oh, the pillowcases too. Yeah, that's, um, so like, I want to hear a little bit more about the transition between, you know, you had online business, brand deals. Now you have like physical products, customer service, shipping delays. Like, let me tell you, it is a whole (laughs) nother world. And it was definitely, I feel like a little bit of a rude awakening going from a service-based business to a product-based business, learning how to work with manufacturers, learning about lead times, learning how to set up an e-commerce website, really learning to lean into my team where I'm not really like the main person and the only person. Before I started that With Frizz and Frills, I really was, for the most part, on my own, except for Ryan helping me here a little bit. He'd help me with photo shoots, things like that. And then I had hired an assistant for literally like five hours a week who could just help me with some little odds and ends tasks. To now where we have, you know, three people who full-time, we have two that are part-time, and it's a whole— it's, there's just so many more moving parts. Wow, I can't even comprehend this like whole world of yours. Do you have the two? Oh, or sorry, not two. You, you and Ryan, and then you have three other. So, part-time. well, it's it's us. Yes, correct. It's us two, and then we have Amber, who started out as that five hour a week assistant, who now she's full time with us, and then we have um, two part time, who's one is my assistant, another is our social media manager, and I just hired a video editor part time as well. Yeah, so. It's a lot of moving parts. So the transition to, oh, especially over this last year of learning how to be a boss truly and, and a manager and a leader versus just being this one woman show that kind of like does it all or micromanages. That was one of the things I hated most about the corporate world was the amount of micromanaging that would happen. And I literally vowed starting Curlfriend Collective. I'm like, I will not be the micromanager. I will not be that person that I hated. And I, how do I not recreate the wheel, right? Like, how do I not just repeat what I've seen? So really trying to learn, you know, from books and other resources on how to be a better leader and how to lean into those people and give them that trust. That's mm-hmm. been a really big transition. But man, working with manufacturers is a whole nother thing too. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty great. Like yeah. where where are your scrunchies manufactured? So these are manufactured in China because you can go are, out there? Hmm? Are you I gonna do a business I, trip? I want to. I want to go out there and actually visit our facilities and everything, but we haven't been able to because of how close down things have been with COVID. So I mean, it's I don't need I don't even know if they're fully open still right now. They've been so up and down. But um, so cool. China is actually the main manufacturer in the world for silks. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like China and I think India also is a pretty big manufacturer. Wow. But that's by far. Yeah. Like, the majority of silks that are manufactured are going to be manufactured in China, at least at minimum the fabric itself. Yeah. Wow. But we have an all-in-one uh, manufacturer who does the printing, the silk making, the, you know, scrunchy sewing, like the whole thing. They take care of it all for us. Um, but it's a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so with like starting Girlfriend Collective, do you feel like you're still giving the same love to Frizz and Frills? Or Great like, question. Or like, do you feel like you're giving up on your first baby? Like, what do you— It's a you really hard at? balance. Um, it's actually been some, the thing that I've struggled with the most since launching Girlfriend Collective is— how much time do I give to each company and how do I also not burn my candle at both ends? And I feel guilty when I'm giving one more over the other. So that's been a learned thing. I think I'm still learning pretty heavily on how to balance that because there's no way that you can give everything 100% all the time, right? Yeah. I'm sure you guys can feel that as well because it's— yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult. Luckily, I think one thing that does go great with this is that 
both businesses are founded on a very similar community. So a lot of things can go back and forth and I can still be in that kind of curly world, but they're, they're just two completely different animals without a doubt. Leaning into other people to help me has been one of the biggest, biggest learning curves and honestly, biggest blessings. So throughout your entrepreneurship journey, having two businesses, the whole thing, what has been your biggest struggle? That's a hard question, but. It is a hard question. Um, biggest struggle. I feel like there are so many like micro struggles throughout every day in business. So I'm like, how can I just pick one? <laughs> yeah. Are there like reoccurring you know what I mean? ones? I try not to have reoccurring ones because we want to squash it first and be like, how do we not repeat this? <laughs> oh man, I have plenty of reoccurring problems. <laughs> oh man. Um, one of my biggest, okay, I'll give you, I've got one example. When we launched our silk pillowcases, one of the things that I did not think about was the, how many competitors we have in silk pillowcase world. Silk pillowcases are everywhere. They're all over Amazon. They're all over literally everywhere. You can go anywhere and pretty much get a silk pillowcase or a satin pillowcase. There is a difference, by the way. Oh, wow. And um, satin is normally polyester. It's like oh. the, actually, it's the she it's the way the fabric is woven. Oh. Yeah. To make the satin uh, texture. But if you see satin pillowcase and it doesn't say silk, it's literally plastic. Oh, oh. Yeah. I think I had a pillowcase yeah, like which that. which is why it doesn't break. And I returned it because it was like scratchy. Mm. But yeah. Yeah. Anyways. They don't hold up. Mm. No. Silk's better. <laughs> um, but we were launching our silk pillowcases, and on the morning of the launch, we were launched at a price point that was more at a luxury price point with some of our top competitors at the highest end. Well, we're coming in new, and I did not realize, I'm like, we need to be more competitive in this specific thing. We're not the only ones who have something like this. You know, people can't get these elsewhere. People can get silk pillowcases other places. So when we launched, it flopped. Oh, wow. It did not. The first hour, I was like, this is not working. How many did you pre-purchase? Um, At that point, I probably purchased like 50 of each or something okay. like that. Normally, we try, we try not to do anything too wild, you know, for our quantities, especially when we're going to first start a new product line. And we just like test it out. So when we launched it, I immediately was like, oh, well, this is a flop. This isn't working. And I immediately texted Amber, who's our other person full-time, and she handles a lot of the back end. I was like, we need to pivot. We need to pivot immediately. We need to send out to our community that we messed up and we were actually supposed to receive these with a 20% off coupon code. We need to make a new email really quick. Two hours later, we sent out another email. And then sales started coming in. Oh my wow. gosh. So quick pivots are really important. How the 20% off. I love that you didn't change the price. You gave them like a discount. Yeah. Like a, mm -hmm. that's a good. Kept the high, the, the same MSRP. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that was definitely an aha moment that is like, okay, if there are competitors out there, we need to be more competitively priced because people have to get a chance to learn our product and know why they love it. Whereas this, we can be at that higher price point because we're one of the only ones out there who are doing this. What kind of advice would you give yourself before you started your businesses? If you knew what you knew now, what would you tell yourself? I would have told her to stop caring so much about what other people think. Stop caring so much about whether it's the right decision because you never really know if it's the right decision. Woo! Wow, that's a good one. Holy crap. Right? You never know. Yeah. So you just have to make the best decision for you at that given time. And the longer that you wait to make that decision, the more you're just kind of burying yourself and putting off <sighs> something. Oh, you're speaking to me. <laughs> Well, because I'm speaking to myself too. Like this is, these are things that I've learned that I do and I need to stop doing. <laughs> you know, putting so much investment in what other people think or what other people are telling you to do is we should not give them that much power. Like I actually, I talked about this in stories, I think a couple days ago where I, I was thinking, you know, where you need to listen to your gut, right? I feel like we've been trained for so long as kids going through school in every way, oh, well, your teacher is right. You know, listen to them. Just just follow what they say. Oh, your parents are right. Just follow what they say. Oh, your boss is right. Just follow what they say. And we've been taught not to listen to our gut and our intuition. And I'm 
relearning how to listen to my intuition again. Because most of the time, any time in business, I haven't listened to my gut. And I've just been like, oh, they probably know. They didn't freaking know. Yeah. Because no one knows like you do. Right. They don't know what's right for you. Only you know what's right for you. That's hard sometimes. It is hard. That's hard actually all the time. Yeah, It is. (laughs) It is. And it's it's something that you have to, it's like a muscle you need to learn and flex and build. And I'm I'm working pretty heavily on that this year. That is speaking, that's speaking to me. Yeah. Like, yeah. We should have more conversations like this. I love that message. Yeah. Yeah, That was really good. good. Okay. Wait, I know that was the last question, but like a super fast one. Yeah. Go ahead. Three book recommendations. Ooh. Okay. 10X is easier than 2X. And I'm currently reading Who Not How, which I was telling you about earlier. So both of those, they're by the same person. And it's very much so about retraining your mind, your mindset. As entrepreneurs, we don't necessarily need to work ourselves to the bone in order to be the most successful. You can lean into your team more. You can lean into other people's genius zones in order to get you where you need to go. If you keep trying to do it yourself, and not knowing where you're going or not knowing how to do it, you're just literally just on this bicycle that's just stationary and you're not going to go anywhere very fast because you're going to keep on tripping and you're going to keep on just trying to figure out something that you don't know when somebody else you could have talked to or leaned into and they would have figured it out in literally a tenth of the time and probably done it more efficiently. Those two were perfect. Um, Perfect. And if you guys have more uh, questions for Chloe on book recommendations, you can DM her. Where can they find you, Chloe? (laughs) You can find me at Friz and Frills pretty much on any social platforms. It is a double Z, double Z on both Friz Friz and Frills. And Frills. And at Curlfriend Collective to get our silk hair accessories. Yes. Thank you so much for coming today. And Shelby, where can they find you? You can find me at Mickey's Bakes. And you can find me at Tricky Foods. You can find us collectively and this podcast at Screw It, Let's Do This. That's it. And you can listen to the pod on anywhere that you listen to podcasts, YouTube, and yeah, you guys, I I think that's everything. So subscribe, tell your friends, and we'll see you next episode. Bye. Bye.